Welcome to Brain and Avat. We are delighted to be joined by Dan Demetrio, and we're going to be talking about monuments. Dan, would you like to start with the thought experiment? Sure. So imagine that you are a partner in an interracial relationship, an interracial marriage. And um, you are decorating your house or your house has decorations in it, of course. And you put up pictures, both partners are interested in putting up pictures of their loved ones and their family. And it's it would be presumably a fact that you would have uh, pictures up of people who would disapprove of your interracial relationship, maybe your mom or your grandfather or something like that. And this is probably true of almost everyone who's in an interracial relationship. <laughs> and there are lots of variants on this, what we could call the domestic analogy. There are a lot of variants we can play around with during the course of the conversation. Should my wife not put the pictures up out of respect for me? Should I, out of my love for my wife, want her to put the pictures up? Right. And what sort of what sort of other things that could cause racial tension in our in an interracial household what should be put up or not i personally take as a point of departure this domestic analogy in thinking about racist monuments and i think that well the default position is that i want my wife to put up those pictures i would want my if i were in an interracial relationship i would want my partner to put up pictures of her ancestors and culture heroes of her people or whatever, to instill pride and give a sense of meaning and history to our family, our shared family. And uh, I wouldn't resent it. Um, but there are things I would resent. I do think if it was a meaningless sort of racist tchotchke, something that was gotten at a like garage sale say a minstrel show advertisement I talk about in one of my papers, imagine that the white partner just thought, oh, that was interesting and put up some sort of minstrel show advertisement and I were black and it had no meaning to my partner, whatever. I would be like, well, why, why should that go up? That's not really meaningful. It doesn't help the family at all. But if it's an ancestor, even if it's Robert E. Lee, I would want that up. Okay. Myself, right. If I were black. So it could, it, it isn't really a function of, well, who did more harm to black people like conf the Confederacy or minstrel shows? Well, the Confederacy. So it isn't really a function of how harmful the ancestor was, I think. So it has a lot to do with irrational, perhaps, factors like the presentation of what's going on. So in my view, likewise, a monument to someone who materially harmed Black Americans is way more acceptable than if it is done in a way that doesn't advertise that harm or rub anyone's faces in it, right? So this has to do with the aesthetics of it, as opposed to a monument maybe to someone who, who actually helped Black Americans, like Lincoln, that might be constructed in a way that is demeaning. So I'm thinking about like the DC Emancipation Monument, where you have, which is actually, if I remember correctly, is a copy of a abolitionist piece of artwork of Lincoln raising his hands over a slave in chains, bending at Lincoln's knees. A lot of people object to that monument and it and a, a copy of it has been taken down, I think, in Baltimore, but the DC one still stands. It has a lot to do more with representation of, of the monument and uh, then, then who the monument honors or what sort of evils the person so honored d did. This domestic analogy could be useful in thinking about when a monumentary landscape or heritage landscape is skewed. So you guys know about this in South Africa and we know about this in America. Most of the monuments are of course to whites and there needs to be some sort of remediation there where we need more monuments and more decorations. If my black partners, if my black partner like had a house fire 
And she lost like a lot of pictures and so forth in this house fire before she married me. Why I have all these pictures and all these family heirlooms and I'm putting them up everywhere, but my side of the family is just over overwhelming everything from her side of the family. And our kids are just seeing pictures and heirlooms from my side of the family. That's not right. I would try to find as much as possible, any sort of pictures or something to put together to represent her side of the family. I would make that a priority. And I think that's really what South Africa has been doing and, and the United States has been doing. And that should continue to be done. So I think there's some very interesting elements to your position. I find the analogy quite compelling. I find it quite convincing. But I want to talk about that analogy a bit more. You focused on the harms that the person who we're venerating in the photo or the person who we're venerating in the statue performed, and that those harms aren't really nearly as important as the way they're represented. So I like the discussion of the Lincoln statue. But I thought what I would find more important is not the harms, but the good that person did. And that's where there would be a, or maybe not the good that they did, but the importance of that person in the viewer's life. And that's a more important element in whether or not we take down the statue or the photo. So talking about the analogy, Let's say I have a photo of my grandmother up and she disapproves of my gay relationship. By the way, that was not the case. My grandma was very on board with my gay relationships. But let's just say for a moment she wasn't. It seems like my grandmother was very important to me in a very personal way, in a way that when I walk down the town square, through the town square, and I see a statue of someone from 80 years ago who fought in some battle, that person does not have a personal connection to me at all. I never met that person only people who I knew, who knew people would have known that person, it seems very indirect. And so it seems to me like the reason to keep the statue is much less of a reason than the reason to keep the photo of my grandmother, even if the harm in both cases was the same. And that's one possible argument your objector could raise to keeping the statue, but but not to keeping the photo. So there's an important disanalogy in the importance or the good that figure did for me personally. Sure. I guess one thing to say while I'm thinking of it is that this would cut both ways. I guess if we're thinking about Zulus looking for some more monuments or monumentary representation in South Africa or Kosa or whoever, it's okay, well, why do you want that up? Was that person really connected to you? Didn't Zulu even care about, he doesn't even know who you are or whatever, but they want it up. Okay. So we, it would be a, an argument against putting that up and we should just plant a new, another tree there or something like that, but they want it. Yeah. Up. Yeah. I think the argument I'm giving is an argument against having monuments at all, positive or negative. Right. Well, I guess we could begin by acknowledging that you're an outlier perhaps on this question in that way, right? So people seem to be, and I guess I'm less of an outlier on this question. People tend to be, people tend to feel uplifted, inspired by representations of their ancestors or culture heroes around them. I really think that the domestic analogy is the closest one we have to how we decorate our national landscapes. It's like our homes or nation's home decorating. Let's see. I have a little statue of, I have various statues of like Greek figures, especially ones from Samos. So for instance, the father of medicine, right? Hippocrates was from Samos. And so I have this little statuette of, Hipp of Hippocrates on our mantelpiece. This is like long, long ago. And you know what? Who knows if I'm even at all genetically very much related to him more than you are or whatever. But uh, let it's a nice little piece of mythology that helps my children feel like they have great ancestors and maybe they have it in themselves to be great too. Although I call my position sentimentalism, it's not just about, oh, I have warm feelings because I actually have some direct connection to this person. There, there's a, It's like a catch-all for all the very many reasons that we do put up, we do decorate our homes in the way we do. 
and decorate our national landscapes in the way we do. And, and I think part of this idea is that we have it in us to be great or to do great things. So a couple of thoughts. The one is whether it's appropriate to have vicarious pride for others and how we can locate it. So there's a famous statue of Gandhi in the center of Johannesburg and Mahatma Gandhi is lived in South Africa. He's not South African. He played a role in dismantling certain kinds of racist oppression that were present and partly his time in South Africa played a role in what he would later do in India, freeing India from British colonial rule. And he's also a lawyer. So the statue has him dressed in his robes. And as a young child, I watched the Gandhi movie and looked up to that and saw that as someone who I'd like to emulate and, and photographed that monument and felt a sense of pride of someone who kind of shares some of my ideals. There are also calls to have statues of Gandhi removed. And the basis for that is that in some of Gandhi's early diaries, he expressed disdain for black Africans. And part of that, if you look at it contextually, is to say this is someone whose mind shifted over time and that you ought not to hold them liable for their sins, especially when they themselves saw them as sins to be overcome. But nonetheless, there are calls for these statues of Gandhi to be removed. So my question goes a couple of directions. The one is, if you have enough people who say, I don't have this positive sentiment that you had towards this person, I see this person as a racist. And whenever I walk past that statue, my sentiment is one of disdain and disgust. And on that basis, I want it removed. And then for me, where I don't share certain things with Gandhi, I recognize an element of greatness there, which I'd like to emulate. And on that basis, I can say, I'd like the statue to remain. What are the kinds of sentiment that you think would matter? What are the ancestral links? And how do we balance these kind of contrary sentiments that you can have? Right. So good question. Well, everything we're talking about here is couched in prima facie. So if a monument is going to just cause civil war, then it, the, depending on the sen- how much the two or more groups involved care, the monument should be taken down. But uh, so it depends. I'm not a moralist. I'm not what I call a moralist about monuments. So it doesn't, to me, it does not matter whether the person was good or bad. Now, some authors in this, on this topic are moralists. They think that we really do have to evaluate and dig into the history of a figure and see if what sort of evils they've done and if the evils they've done out, outweigh the goods they've done and so forth. I'm just, I don't see the advantages of this view. I don't think this is how we, we go about in our own households usually. So I'm not a moralist about that. I don't think Gandhi's statue should be taken down for that reason. I'm totally okay with people taking down Gandhi's statues though, in some cases. So the University of Ghana took down a Gandhi statue some years ago. And that, insofar as I understand what happened in that case, they were, it was like a gift from the Indian government and the Indian government was like sending a lot of students to that university or whatever. The Ghanaian government wanted it there to warm ties between, so they could export more stuff to India or whatever. But it wasn't like some sort of organic, you know, support from Ghanaians to have that up. And there's, there wasn't like a significant enough population of Indians who were all about it. Ghanaian, like Indian Ghanaians who were all about it. Right. So they just, they were mad about the, just the points that you brought up and they took it down. And I think that's fine. And because again, it's just like, I'm putting up, it'd be like my putting up a Gandhi picture, just what, so I could like, whatever, sell more stuff to like Indians that I'm bringing to my home or something like that. And my kids are like, what are you doing here? Right. (laughs) So, so I'm fine with that. But if there's like a significant Indian South African population, which there is, and if he's an important culture hero to them, then things get more interesting. That's a really complicated case for me because those Indian South Africans also have a strong and perhaps primary duties to their Black South African co-nationals. And Gandhi did leave the country and so forth. So there's... And he's more identified with an Indian emancipation movement than a South African one. So I'm trying to understand the position. So on the one hand, it sounds to me 
like a utilitarian position. So it sounds like you're saying, okay, there's all these people that have positive sentiment when they look at the statue. There's some people who have negative sentiment, but the number of people with positive sentiment outweigh them, and so we keep the statue. But in another case, there's lots of negative sentiment, very little positive sentiment, and so we don't keep the statue. Is that the position? But then you also mention duties. Yeah. But at the same time, you say it doesn't actually matter what the person did in the past. And it sounds like the duties to keep the statue would depend on what the person actually did. If the duties purely depend on people's reactions, their sentiments to when they look at the statue, then really it sounds like you're engaging in a utilitarian exercise. Yeah, there's non-consequentialist and consequentialist reasons for my moderate but still distinctively preservationist position. I'm probably the strongest preservationist writing on this in, in, in philosophy. The non-consequentialist element of it is that I think we have a right to comm commemorate our ancestors and culture heroes. In a multi-racial or multinational state, whites should want blacks to celebrate their culture heroes in America and South Africa. And blacks should want whites in um, their co-nationals in American South Africa to celebrate theirs and to decorate the national home in, in those ways. But those have to be done in ways that keep it positive, that emphasize the greatness or importance of those people without insulting the enemies, not making it clear who's not to do it in a offensive way. So I here's another thought experiment I give. So imagine instead of a Lee statue where he's riding a horse, or there are many such statues of Boer generals riding horses, right, all over the place in South Africa. You had, suppose you had Lee like with a rearing horse on top of a bunch of skulls of Union dead, right? That would be a bad monument. Take race out of it. That would be an offensive monument to the Northerners. If you're trying to, if you're trying to heal the country, you should not have that sort of statue. However, having a Lee statue on top of, obviously we all know why he's on top of the statue. We all know that, right? But there, it's a very, two different, very, two very different statues there. So that's the non-consequentialist side. And the consequentialist side is, well, let the consequentialist side is that if interracial trust is high, then it's good. Then there are like all these benefits to, to having the ancestors and culture heroes of the different peoples of your land represented and so forth, I think. If interracial trust is running low, so let's do a variant on the domestic analogy here. Suppose you're in an interracial relationship and there's like interracial tension between you and your spouse, and it's like threatening the relationship. It's not clear to me that the right thing to do is to take down some of the pictures. Now, partially because, like, for me, it would be like, okay, I, I forced you to take the picture down. What win, what win is that for me in our relationship? Do I trust you more because I forced you to take the picture down? I don't think so. So it would have to be you who wants to take the picture down, something like that. But again, my hope would be that it, well, if you're so willing because you care about me to take the picture down, then you could leave the picture up because what I wanted to know is that you care about me. So Mandela, who I think was a genius of people, this is why Mandela, for the most part, did not take monuments down, did not allow monuments to be taken down to Afrikaans people, Afrikaner people. And there's there was a, an expectation that he would. And he had to, he spent, I think, political capital. It's hard for me to find like the real quotes. I think a lot of this was behind the scenes, but we definitely can see news articles where people are anticipating widespread removalism the second that South Africa became democratic and it didn't. And he told them, look, these people, this is their heroes, villains to us or heroes of them and vice versa. And we have to, right. so I consider my position a Mendelian position. And so he had a great sense of tribal psychology. 
And but I think he was being very practical here and just understanding, well, we need to keep this train on the track. And once you start ripping down people's monuments, they know that they're next. So don't do it. So yeah, there is a consequentialist element, but there is also that that I think non-consequentialist element. So I want to give you a case that tries to push the two elements in opposite directions. <clears throat> and I'm glad you brought up Mandela because it's based on what's called the Mandela effect. So I'm not sure if you've heard of the Mandela effect. I'm sure I'm going to get this wrong, the etymology of this, but basically the definition is that there's certain phenomena or certain group beliefs that we have that are false, but we believe them as a group, that something happened. So people call it the Mandela effect because there was this group belief that Mandela died at a certain point, but he didn't. But everyone believed it. Every, in fact, it happened so often here in South Africa that our news services sometimes release the news. And this happened every few years that Mandela had died when he hadn't. It happened all the time. People originally believed that he died on when he was in prison. Then they believed that he died a few years after he came out. And this would happen periodically, that everyone thought Mandela died. And the Mandela effect is fascinating. It generates these very weird group false beliefs. But those false beliefs often have very emotive content. And so you can imagine a case, not a Mandela case, but another case of a figure that never existed. But there's this group ethos. There's this cultural heritage that's built up around this non-existent figure that did X, Y, or Z. And let's just say this figure did wonderful things, right, in, in this group myth. You could say like religion is a Mandela effect if you're skeptical about religious events actually happening. And then monuments go up for this non-existent figure that nothing happened. Now, in that case, it seems to me like a lot of your non-consequentialist reasons for keeping or not keeping the statue fall away because nothing actually happened. And even if you're not measuring whether what happened was good or bad, I'm assuming that a lot of your non-consequentialist reasons pertain to the fact that this is a historical figure that this person really did exist, that they did things. I understand that you have non-consequentialist reasons around relationship building for the viewers and the detractors of that statue, but I think a lot of your non-consequentialist reasons will fall away if the figure never existed. And so what you left with are your consequentialist reasons for keeping or not keeping the statue. And so what you're going to say is, keep the statue if when people look at this non-existent figure, they feel good about it. They feel a sense of empowerment. They feel a sense of unity. Everything goes well in society. Keep the figure. And if everything, if people have a negative feeling about this on the whole, have a negative feeling about the statue, then get rid of it. And I think that's actually your position at the end of the day, because you say you're not a moralist. You don't really care about what they did or didn't do. I think that the Mandela case statue, the Mandela effect statue and normal statues of people who actually did exist are very similar on your account. They handle the same way. What I'm trying to get at is I'm skeptical that you have any viable non-consequentialist reasons for keeping the statue in place. I think at the end of the day, if you're going to be a non-moralist about this, the only thing that you can really refer to is what are the consequences. Yeah. So how much does this, how much of this devolve into questions about the difference between do I have a right to food? Do I have a right to food? A lot of people be like, or do I have a right to my food? Um, a lot of people say, yeah, you got a right to to your food. Now, right, it sounds non-consequentialist. I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's rights talk. Right to my food. But the only reason that I maybe care about my food or whatever is that it benefits me or makes me healthy. So is that consequentialist? So now instead of food, let's put in cultural myths, even false ones, right? So if it's important to my people that we wandered in the desert for 40 years or something like that, and we're captive in, isn't there a dispute about whether Jews were ever in Egypt? Isn't there some dispute about that? remember back in during the heydays of the new atheist movement, right? They loved banging people over the head with that one. There's no evidence that Jews were even in Egypt or some, something like that. 
Is that right? So, but suppose like this is like a really important part of the Jewish people mythos. It helps bind them together. It's at the root of so many analogies and coping mechanisms for hardships and stuff like this for them. So is it, uh, do they have a right to that? What do you think about that? It's like they have a right to their false beliefs that are nurturing to them and so forth. That's not to say that we don't have a right to criticize that or say that's not true in fact or whatever. I think that's where I'm at on this. So I'm totally okay with like different nations having, so like Greece wants to claim Alexander the Great because that really helps Greek pride. And like Macedonia wants to claim Alexander the Great because that helps Macedonian pride. And I'm okay with both of that. And <laughs> it's not like we have to get the record straight between them. And I, I definitely am for academics using the best epistemic virtues to get at the truth on that. But that's not, I think, it's not like I have some opinion about, well, you guys really, it's wrong for you to have your monuments up or it's wrong for you to culturally claim him or whatever. So on that front, I wonder what grounds the right. You've spoken about the idea that a nation should be able to celebrate its figures. And then you give the case where you've got two different nations who both claim the same figure. So on what basis do you get to say, this is my guy? Am I allowed to celebrate Gandhi even though I'm not Indian? How do we draw that link? If it's the case that it's really just, I have a positive sentiment towards this person and that grounds my right, then Jason's point holds, which is there's no real non-consequentialist justification for it because there's no actual right. Well, maybe you're just wanting to gives you the right. Again, like if you, I, this, yeah, this, I did not really, I've never really thought about monuments and cultural appropriation in this way, but yeah, that's where we're getting to there. So you may say, well, if it's your home and you want to put up decorations in your house to my ancestors, as if they were yours, if it is your home, there is some right you have there to decorate your home as you see fit. Of course, this is going on right now with a three-way battle. You have a lot of Black nationalists wanting to claim, or Black advocates wanting to claim Cleopatra. There's this Netflix documentary out about Cleopatra. And I only saw the trailers, but there's like this Black historian woman who's saying, my grandma or my mom told me, don't listen to them. Cleopatra is black or something like that. So I don't know whether it's a documentary or docudrama or whatever. So you have that. And then you have the Egyptians, like she's not black. And I haven't really heard what the, but the Egyptians are all mad about this. And I don't know what the Egyptians are saying. You, you of course, have the Greeks saying, well, she was Ptolemaic Greek. So everyone wants to claim her. And it makes for great social media and mockery of each other and teasing each other and memes. But I don't know. I don't see where any sort of force or coercion or comes into play. This is tough when one, one group has had so much history erased or doesn't have a long tradition of keeping history in ways that makes it easier, doesn't doesn't carve in stone or didn't have written language. Those groups are really vulnerable to losing a lot of history. And then, so it is it is inevitable that I think that they're going to cast about for whatever they can. I guess I just have permissive attitudes about them claiming things that aren't theirs, even when it's appropriation. Yes, yeah, so there's the appropriation point, which I suppose is some people might not be allowed to erect monuments where everybody says that person is great, they're a wonderful, venerable person, but you don't get to erect them. And then there's the question of saying, well, how do you understand the vicarious pride? So some people say, this person is my ancestor, and so I want to be able to put it up. But as Jason points out earlier, it's different to a relative. It's someone who we say, well, we're associated with how are those links to be done. And is there a sense in which you have to prove it, or I just have to have an affinity for it? I just have to say, I like this guy. And as the state, we're going to put this person up. And if you don't like it, well, we'll then add up the sentiment points. But or do I have to say, look, we can show you how our heritage ties up with this person. And there's some kind of a logical story that can be told, which entitles us to put this person up. I also wonder about you have a your case with the husband and wife. You say, well, it wouldn't 
really be nice of the wife to say, look, I'm in pain by seeing the sort of picture you have up of grandma who clearly hated me. I couldn't ask you to take it down, but if you wanted to take it down, that would be enough. And what you have, at least in the States, is that a lot of white people will say, I don't like these statues. I want them taken down. And other white people say, but I think they're really important. And so it seems like we can't say there's a homogenous group of white people. Who do we supposed to listen to on this front? Yeah. How would you determine these sort of intra-group battles over the question? Yeah, this is tough. Migration makes it tough. Demographic change makes this way harder. And I think, I, I do think we need to distinguish among subgroups of whites. I think Southern whites or what's sometimes the heritage Southern whites or something like that are the real advocates are the ones who have a sort of special affinity for these things. I am not obviously one of those, but, but I just, I generally see the, the, a certain sort of logic that says they should stay up. But as those people move, suppose all the Southern whites just moved somewhere. And they are anyway moving. There is massive demographic change in America. It's as weird to say that those monuments should stay up as to say that when I sell my house, they should keep the decorations. So if we're going to be a nomadic people, and it seems like the world is just becoming hyper nomadic, everyone's just moving around, then we have to start acting like Bedouins or something and just keep everything in our tent and just take it with us and not put down monuments or not certainly not expect people to keep them up when we ourselves move. So yeah, that really is happening. And that's what I think it part, part of what monuments are about. I think monuments, I'll run this idea past you guys, see what you think, but I think monuments are a, so, are a social technology that stake claims to land. So they have this signaling effect, which is every kind of obvious, but I'm just putting a name to it. They signal, okay? They signal the dominance of a group or at least the presence of a group in an area, a, a claim a group has to living in this area, all right? Who has enough social cachet to actually put up the monument and make everyone look at it, all right? And so that's why I think that it's important that we have more monuments for Black Americans. But, but they're also like... They're, they're also like canaries in the coal mine. <laughs> you put a monument up, and if anyone's taking it down, like if, it, if they don't take it down, okay, we're secure here. <laughs> but if they take it down, then you know you're not as secure as you thought you were, right? So it's actually this nice little early warning mechanism of cultural inclusion or perhaps supremacy, depending on what you do with other people's monuments. So, yeah, it's so to some degree, Monuments serve their purpose when they're put up and they're up, but they're also serving their purpose when they're taken down. And, and it's a little weird to insist that, that they stay up um, when you're not even around there anymore to defend them or whatever. So, yeah. So I've got two objections. The one is follow a follow-up of my previous point which mark pushed further and the second one is based on what mark has just said to you now so the first objection is you said that people in one group should support the historical representation of another group's ancestors so let's say i'm white i should support black people in putting up monuments that represent their culture right not black you people as such, but black co-nationals. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Fair enough. So the people who I live with in my mm -hmm. country, in my state, but you've also said that the historicity of it doesn't really matter. It's really the sentiment that matters. So I want to give you two scenarios and I want you to tell me if there's any difference in the virtue of these scenarios. So scenario one, I'm a white South African and I look around and I see there's not enough statues of black ancestors, right, in South Africa. So what I do is I go and research black ancestors and I either erect monuments of black ancestors or I go to the relevant councils who represent black interests and I say to them, I suggest or I really encourage or I'd like to help you do a crowdfunding campaign or whatever it is 
to help you erect these statues. And you'd say that is, I assume on your position, a virtuous act, right? It's the kind of act that I should participate in. I should be encouraging this in whatever way is appropriate. Now that's scenario one. Scenario two, I engage in a propaganda campaign to invent a historical figure that never existed. And he's a black figure that never existed but he's meant to encapsulate all of the values and the pride of, of black South Africans. And I then push for the same statue to be erected, whether I do it myself or I go to the relevant black interest groups and I say, I think the statue should be promoted. So in my other life, I'm a marketer and I could absolutely engage in this kind of campaign. I could push out adverts for this non-existent historical figure. I could talk to the pe people at Wikipedia and get them to invent a page about this figure that never existed and instill in, in the ethos in South Africa that there was this very important figure that hasn't been correctly represented and hasn't been celebrated. According to you, if I understand correctly, those two actions are equally virtuous, those two scenarios. Um, well, my intuition is that the first one's okay. The first one's okay. Actually, like one of my favorite Mandela monuments was done wasn't it by a, a white south african the one that's like the metal spikes of mandela where if you look at it from the right angle you see his face and it's like prison bars or whatever if you look one way but that's a i think that's by it's a good monument south africa has a good monument. i think there's nowhere putting up consistently as good monuments recently as south africa so i'm okay with that i think that now things are becoming racial mistrust is on the increase and increasingly the race of the artist does matter and there's some been some black pro-black monuments put up in america that are really bad and i think they're bad because there was just this insistence that it had to be done by a black sculptor and that not enough time was given or whatever a particularly horrible one to martin luther king just came out and was unveiled the one that people think doesn't have their heads and just has King and his wife hugging in some way and looks pornographic from certain angles and so forth. So I'm okay with a white person making a Mandela statue. As far as creating a myth, that, that does seem to me out of bounds. My intuition is just that that's like they have to make up their own myths. Well, that's... I think the drive of my case is not whether I'm a white South African or not. So suppose I'm a black South African doing this. So am I... Am I doing something equally virtuous in celebrating an actual figure versus celebrating a mythological figure that I invent and mm -hmm. produce the same sentiments in people? They're both equally proud. On your account, you cannot distinguish between the two cases, but my intuition is that something is going wrong in the second case. Yeah, like partially it could be because if it's a fiction, it could cause more trauma to the group once they find out it's a fiction. Uh, so if you have a heroic figure that was real, you should go for that because it's less vulnerable. Let's assume but, no one will find out, or yeah. we could even argue the other way that the real figure is more vulnerable because they were a real person. So the likelihood that they did something wrong mm -hmm. that would to be mm -hmm. discovered is even greater. Mm -hmm. Whereas the mythological figure I could protect. I wouldn't instill any negative myths about the mythological figure. Yeah, yeah. Another, you may have some obligations to real figures uh, to commemorate them and not to ignore them in, on, in favor of a, a mythological one. So, so there's that too. Okay, good. So that's but what I was trying to get you to. That's the point I was trying to get you to. And if you take that point, then it seems historicity is important. In other words, what actually happened. And once you open that door, then it's, well, what actually happened was good or bad, why doesn't that count? It count, count for what? It count for whether we should take the statue down or not. So if what actually happened matters and what actually happened was that this person performed atrocities, then that should count towards removing the figure if you think what actually happened matters. Oh. So I'm trying to, I'm trying to oh, drive yeah. you into that pigeonhole. Oh, yeah. How, so how do you feel about like a domestic analogy. So suppose you had a grandfather who was good to you, but he murdered someone for drugs. 
would you be like, I'm not going to put up his picture because he murdered someone for drugs? What's your intuition on that? So I think there's a disanalogy because the person that he murdered or their family is not the person in my home looking at the image versus the person who was harmed, their descendants, I assume, are walking around the same town square. Yeah, that's interesting. But as if we're going to strict, if we're going to focus on strict moralism, then look, if you're going to push me into moralism, I don't want to be there. I'm okay. not a yeah, I mean, but it, but yeah, I think you are. Yeah. I'm saying you have to be. You're committed to it. Is yeah. my point. Yeah. yeah. So I think you could put up a picture to a grandparent who killed someone for drugs. Like I'm picking like the worst reason to kill somebody. Right. It's not even like killing people in unjust war. It's like just a bad reason to kill somebody. But he was good to you or whatever, or you have sentiments, it bounced you on his knee or whatever. So yeah, and how do you feel like the Genghis Khan monument that they put up in Mongolia about 15 years ago? It's like this huge, I don't even know, it's like over 40 feet high or something. It's like this huge monument. Well, how do you feel about the Genghis Khan monument? So are you trying to push me into the position where I say, because the historicity matters and because Genghis Khan did bad things, he shouldn't be given a monument, not of that size and stature and importance. And then you want to say, no, but that's not a good reason. Right. Is that the, the argument? I, I'm, I want to lead with the intuitions. So. Yeah. Look, my intuition is that monuments are silly. And this was going to be my second objection is, I know you said that I'm in the minority on this, but I'm going to resist that claim. I wonder whether you have any empirical data to support this. Maybe your empirical data is, well, look, monuments exist, and that alone is sufficient evidence that they matter. But I, I don't think that just because a monument is there that all the people surrounding it care about it. I think it's just the person who put it up, either because they really care or because there was a budget and they had to spend the budget somehow, or because that person had to be seen as caring about the heritage in order for them to be elected or whatever the reason. I My intuition is, and this is going back to Mark's point about there's different types of white people, is that there's not just different types of white people. If you were to ask all the white people who that person is in the statue, a lot of them wouldn't even know. The kids wouldn't know. A lot of the adults wouldn't know. If they do know, they might have a whole lot of false beliefs. I don't think there's a unified pride at all. I think it's highly fragmented and that it's a vast minority of people who care either positively or negatively oh, yeah. about the statue. Yep. That I that certainly seems right. All right. So we're all peasants. I'm guessing you're a peasant. I'm a peasant in the sense that like my grandparents were picking sponges off the bottom of the Mediterranean. Okay. And I don't know what your grandparents were doing, great grandparents were doing, but it's some it was probably some peasant ass stuff and you had a very humble home. Okay. But for, if you're talking to somebody of British landed gentry that have had their home, that are like in a home that's been around for hundreds of years, these homes, they add a little bit to it, but they them they would need, they need historians to even know who are the pictures of these people on the wall? What are these things too, right? But they're keepers of a great country house that they add to and that they feel obligated to keep for their family and future generations, right? This is right, grand, grand stuff. I honor it. And I think I, I honor the country that tries to replicate that on the national scale, right? So you, and even in our little brief times of even having houses, which by the way, we keep moving from again and again. And so again, cause we're, we're really nomadic people. <laughs> uh, if you even live in a house for 30 years, you know, little things get added, little things get taken down and there, there are parts of it. There are pieces that you're attached to. There are pieces your mom's attached to your sister, so forth. But these are very different. So together you decorate this household in a kind of organic way. And so now there are like being conquered and all your stuff's taken down and new people put stuff in. There's also like moral revolutions, like the Chinese cultural revolution or what's going on in America right now, which is a cultural revolution or when Christians take over or something like that. 
where they go iconoclastic, right? They just start t- taking everything down and starting fresh. I think that's very, I'm not a big fan of that stuff, right? So as I point out somewhere, the best way for your house to be tacky and outdated in 15 years is for you to start with a fresh slate and just, I'm going to decorate this in the most chic, stylish way. Because it's going to be, ob- you're just going to go in your house, it's just obvious this is 1985, right? I mean, it's just screaming 1985 or it's screaming 1990 or whatever. And it just is tacky. and doesn't mean anything, right? You got to slowly, organically change things. And then it takes over a real character and it's much better that way. And so, and so with monument and heritage landscapes, but that means that a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the figures up there, I have no attachment to per se, right? But I do want it there. It's been there. <laughs> it's been there as important to someone that I care about or something like that. And so, yeah, I think that's like my general answer to that sort of really good worry. So I want to make two claims. The one is when the Taliban took over in Afghanistan, they destroyed statues of Buddha. Now let's assume there were no Buddhists that lived in Afghanistan anymore. I think destroying those monuments to the Buddha were wrong. And I think even if there were no Buddhists at all that existed anymore, I think it would be wrong in the same way that if you destroyed Inca monuments now, that you would be robbing humanity of this important artifact. And the other one would be that I think if you newly erect a statue of someone who is clearly evil and has no good qualities, no venerable qualities, that might be the kind of thing where you ought to prohibit it, or at least have reason not to do it, or others would have good reason to object to it. So you erect now a massive statue to Hitler or to Stalin or to Mao, that it's not preserving some historical artifact so future generations can know. And you do it in a manner you say, it's quite clear that you're encouraging people to venerate this evil figure did these bad things. I might have a different intuition, let's say, that you find an historic artifact of a pharaoh who happened to have killed lots of people, that destroying that statue would be immoral, but erecting a new one seems to be different to me. Right. So the, what are the Buddhas of Banyan or something like that in the Taliban case? Yeah, I agree. I have your intuition there. I think the wrongness of that is because of their sort of, their sort of, I don't know. I don't know how to put it like a historical value or something like that. I think if all the Southern whites left or if enough Southern whites left the South, it would not be wrong to take down. It's not like a Lee statue has anything like that sort of in world cultural sort of importance. That's more like important to them as a port. It's if I left behind a picture of my grandma in my house for some reason, after I sold it to you, you should take down a picture of my grandma. If I had a Rembrandt up that I had left or something like that, you shouldn't toss that in the bin. But so I agree with you on that one about uh, erecting a really evil person. Well, again, 15 years ago, Mongolia erected the Genghis Khan monument. And my intuition is that's totally fine. Even though there was probably no one who has done more wrong than Genghis Khan. So what's your intuition about the Genghis Khan case? Yeah, I'm troubled by it. I wonder what the purpose of it is. It seems to be venerating someone, you know, who engaged in mass slaughter. And there's a trouble there. Maybe the claim is this, is that Mongolia is surrounded by quite strong nations. Uh, It itself is not. And it wants to hearken back to its glorious heyday when it was able to conquer others. And so maybe there's a sense which you say, well, given your stature on the world stage, go ahead and erect your Genghis Khan monument. No one will take you very seriously. And it might be a signal of something else, which is weakness as opposed to strength. I like your argument that monuments are this interesting signal for working out how stable you are in a society. That when people start to take down monuments, it's often a signal of hatred towards that group or those they see as identifiable to the group. And at least you start off by losing steel and stone, but you may very well wind up in a place where there'll be genuine bloodshed and at least gives you a sense of alarm when that's happening. Your explanation for the maybe permissibility of the Genghis Khan statue is more in line with my type of thinking. I'm more of an offense theorist than a moralist about monuments. It isn't that it offends people. It's totally okay that your monument offends people. (laughs) Travis doesn't like when it offends innocent people. I'm totally okay with it offending innocent people. Like I'm totally okay with the Genghis Khan monument offending innocent Chinese people. 
because I'm more of a nationalist. So what matters is that the gang is caught. You have my ear if there's like a lot of Chinese Mongolians that are like, what is going on here? Then you have my ear. If you are really worried about offending people internationally, that's going to cost you a lot of international business and so forth. Those things have to be worried about, but on, on a purely consequentialist level. In Blenheim Palace, which is the greatest country house in, in England, it was it's the only private house in England that gets to be called the palace. And it is huge. It's magnificent. But there is a bust of a French king there. The money for it was granted because the Duke of Marlborough had this great victory in Blenheim and in Europe. And so over French, it is possible to process monuments, even to people you hate and leave them up, but process them as trophies, right? We enjoy the monument being around. We conquered your people and we like having your people's monuments around. We find it aesthetic. We find it amusing and so forth. So yeah, there's all sorts of all sorts of reasons why you might keep a monument around to even people that you think were evil from another culture. So why the nationalism though? So why does it matter whether it's Chinese people in China offended versus Chinese people in Mongolia? Why draw the boundary at the nation's border? It doesn't have to be. So it, I could be more particular. It's like I'm okay with monuments that are more regional in character or only meaningful to people in a region. And as we've been talking throughout, I'm okay with monuments to sub nations, like inside of a nation, right? Like a black population or white population. And you could have monuments to the world if you want to, but people tend to decorate using this analogy, this domestic analogy, you're probably when you're decorating your home, not trying to give an even-handed portrayal of all the peoples of the world according to their population representation or something like that, right? It's very skewed to your family or those, your loved ones or whatever. And so it's your family's habitation and the country is the land of the nation and so the country gets decorated by the nation. And so it should reflect their, I, it's going to naturally, and I don't see any problem with it, reflect their national prejudices and their national heroes and so forth like that. So, so we have like certain obligations to each other that we, I don't think we have towards others. So if I see some picture in the background of, your Zoom that's like disparaging of my people. Like what claim do I, or Americans or something like that. What claim do I, I mean, I've, I could not associate with you or be, be offended with it, but I don't think I have any claim to how you decorate your house. And I don't think people from other nations have claims to how nations decorate their country sides. So then I want to push an interesting case at you. So suppose tomorrow Germany decides to erect an enormous statue of Hitler huge, enormous statue, right? And a lot of people outside of Germany get offended. So a lot of Jews get offended, Romanians get offended, various people get offended. Have they done something wrong? Do the Jews or the Romanians have any kind of claim over saying, please take that statue down? Do they have any right to say that? Yeah, I don't think so. No. So, but the Jewish Germans and so forth, gypsy Germans and stuff like that have, you know, that's who we need to be worried about as a German, if you're German, you know, but of course it's costly. It's extremely costly. It's burning a lot of cultural capital and it's not something I would advise given the many wonderful culture heroes that Germans have to draw on that are not Hitler. And the Mongolians might not be in that same place, right? And also, I mean, I think, I forget whether it was you or Mark, but talking about how, I think it was Mark talking about, well, it could be a sign of weakness. Yeah, it could be a sign of weakness that they put up that, right? Because people who have a more fragile self-image need to project even more strength. And so 
but there's probably a good reason for that, right? It is probably adaptive to do that. <laughs> I don't believe in, fra I'm not one of these people that like think it's bad to do, like when people say, oh, fragile masculinity, it's like, yeah, masculinity is fragile. Yeah, <laughs> it's own the fragility of masculinity. And that's why you got to guard, you have to be very careful about maintaining it. And there's a reason why. And so, yeah, if your national pride is low, start there. there's a good reason to do these things. And because uh, it helps you get up to a level where you have high pride and then you don't need to show it off so much. And so, and I think Germany is in a place that they, they don't need to like cast about for some sort of culture hero to, they're not so beaten down or defeated or so forth and so forth, or have only one towering figure to point to. But if they did, if they were in that case, and I say this in print, if there's some distant future where Germany is like this weak, has been taken over by communism like Mongolia was for all this time and had so much culture extirpated, extirpated from there and so forth and felt surrounded by much stronger fo foes, et cetera, then yeah, put up the Hitler monument in my view. Yeah, put that up because it's, it isn't like Hitler's worse than Genghis Khan. But it's, it's, it's way more edgy for the Germans, right? The Germans could do something, right? The Germans could kick ass right now to some degree if they wanted to. The Germans are a threat if they wanted to be, et cetera. Mongolia isn't, right? There's all these differences that make it way more edgy for the... You should definitely be keeping an eye out if the Germans put up a Hitler monument in a way that we don't need to be concerned about, I think, if the Mongolians put up and that's why no one cares, right? But again, this isn't a this isn't moralism, right? This is about wait a minute, what what is who's it offending? What does it signal about the future? Stuff like this. This isn't just this isn't a function of because Hitler a thousand years from now will be as bad as Hitler is right now and was as bad as well. It's not like the morality of Hitler changes over time, right? And so what is changing is how much of a threat a Hitler statue signifies.